I'd like to uh, introduce today's speaker. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Ema Smith from uh, the ESRI. Uh, today, Ema will be presenting work on age or stage influences on the transition to junior cycle education um, using data from uh, GUI growing up in Ireland. Ema, thank you. Thanks, Sarah, and thank you for coming along today. Um, so, what I'm talking about today is, is looking at the transition from primary to post-primary education using the two waves of the child court of growing up in Ireland. So, as you most likely know, there's a really very large body of research on the changes in school engagement and self-concept over the transition to second level education. But there's still quite a diversity of opinion about whether th what this reflects. Is it the case that it relates to adolescent development, so that as children and young people grow older, there's a decline in their subjective well-being? So is it related to the adolescence rather than the school structures? Uh, a second strand would kind of focus on the lack of consistency between primary and post-primary education in terms of the different curricula, in terms of the very different approaches to teaching and learning, and to the changes in the social relationships between teachers and students as students move largely from a system where they have one classroom teacher to a system where they have multiple teachers. In, you know, well into the teens. But other researchers, most notably Jacqueline Eccles, have said that really the issue is not development per se or school per se, but the mismatch between young people's developmental needs in early adolescence and the educational structures they're exposed to. But what I want to question here is whether these changes in engagement are related only to the transition period. And as context for that, we did previous work, the post-primary longitudinal study, which looked at changes as young people moved on past first year. And I'll just show you these first. So this shows you, the red shows you a scale of positive interaction between teachers and students. So it's kind of the extent to which they were received praise or positive feedback, and the yellow shows negative interaction, the, the frequency with which they were reprimanded, given out to, either for their behaviour or for their schoolwork. So you'll see here that it, when you start off in first year, that positive interaction really dominates interac negative interaction. So you have a kind of honeymoon period in teacher-student relationships. Uh, but really, as they move through first year, and uh, into second year, we see an increase up to third year in the prevalence of negative interaction with teachers and a corresponding decrease in, in the level of positive interaction. And so by the junior research year, um, they're more evenly balanced. And if we broke this out separately for boys, you would see that boys experience, on average, equal amounts of positive and ne negative interaction. So as a result of that then, or linked to that, we see a change in attitudes to school. So as young people move through junior cycle, um, they're, they're, the extent to which they like school declines, and the extent to which they like their teachers declines, but not to the same extent. So this was based on a longitudinal study that took a cohort of students as they moved into first year. So it's quite different from growing up in Ireland, because growing up in Ireland is an age cohort. So students are followed no matter what stage they're at. So this provides a good way of trying to disentangle age from stage. And to look in particular at whether experiences in keeping with the earlier research are distinctive in second year. And especially, that's especially important given that we found before that second year experiences were the, the key year for student engagement. In a way, the turbulence of moving to second level education disguises a lot. In particular, girls take longer to settle in. They're more likely to report missing their primary school friends and their primary school teachers. So in a way, that can kind of muddy the waters for really understanding engagement with school. Um, so it can be the case, or at least we found previously, that when it get, comes to second year, you have two groups of students emerging. Those who are being more challenged by their schoolwork and investing more time in homework and study in response, and those who are drifting or even disengaging. 
So what I want to do here is to try and unpack that age and stage link. So many of you are familiar with growing up in Ireland data. So here I'm using the, the two waves of the child cohort, so over 8,500 nine-year-olds who were sampled from primary schools. And they were followed up at the age of 13 uh, when 7,400 uh, uh, young people were, were surveyed. So we draw on multiple perspectives in this, with the young person at the heart of that, those perspectives, but also very detailed information from their parents, their teachers, and their school principals. So the real advantage for these analysis is that almost all young people had made the transition to second level education at, by the age of 13, 13 and a half actually. But um, they were evenly divided between first and second year of junior cycle. So they were sa the same age, but they were at very different stages. So I want to look at three outcomes. Um, I want to look at school engagement measures subjectively in terms of the young person's own um, report about the extent to which they like school. I want to look at an objective measure of school engagement in terms of school attendance. And I want to look at engagement with learning um, as measured by the Pierce-Harris Intellectual and School Status uh, subscale, which is a really clunky title, but in effect it's a form of academic self-image of how confident young people feel as learners in the school setting. So I use multi-level models to take account of sampling within schools at primary level because of the, the clustering. Um, I also, for attitudes to school, I have used a cross-classified model to look at the simultaneous effects of the primary and second level att uh, school attended on the attitudes to school. But I probably won't talk about that as much. So in terms of explanatory variables, they're the usual suspects, um, gender, social class, which is here measured using the CSO social class scale with a dominance approach where the higher social class is of either parent is used if they're both in employment. Mother's education, whether children are, and young people are from an immigrant family and whether the young person has a special educational need. I should have said at the beginning, now stop me if anything isn't clear or if you'd like me to say anything else about, about a particular point. So what I want to do is look at primary school experiences, um, school engagement, so children reported whether they liked school at the age of nine and whether they liked their teacher. They also had reported measures of subject engagement, so whether they liked reading and maths. <coughs> We had objective measures of reading and maths achievement using the drum Condra standardized tests, which are curriculum based and have been widely used and have Irish norms. And I also want to look at second level experiences, um, whether the young person experienced difficulties over the transition to second level education. And that's measured using a seven item scale based on the primary caregiver responses. And then uh, we use a measure of as you saw earlier, a uh, previously used measure of the quality of interaction between teachers and students from the student perspective. And again, we distinguish between positive and negative interaction. So if we just look descriptively at, at kind of the extent to which people like school from very much down to hating it, um, you can see, you know, attitudes are, are broadly positive, but there are very marked gender differences. At, even at the age of 13. So girls are much more likely to say they like school very much. Um, boys are more likely to say they only like it a bit or don't like it very much. Now, we can see that there is a strong relationship between their attitudes at nine and their attitudes at 13. It was, a more, it was a simplified measure at nine. They were asked whether they always, sometimes, and never like school because, you know, we felt we couldn't have that many categories. But we can see, you know, there's a picture of flux and there's a picture of, of some degree of consistency. Um, those who have always liked school at nine, there, is, there are kind of proportions that, that have become much more negative. But we can see that for those who never liked school, there is some moving into the kind of positive, but they are much more likely to be also negative about school at the age of 13. So 
in terms of using multi-level models, I'm, I'm mostly focusing on the effect of, of year group, but I'll, I'll tell you briefly what the, the models showed. Um, even controlling for prior differences, girls are more positive about school than boys. And young people with special educational needs are much more negative about school um, than their peers. We see that mother's educational effects are much stronger than social class effects using these measures. Oh. I don't know. What? Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't hit anything, I promise. Yeah. Sorry, I can't get the cursor to... Hang on. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so, liking school is associated with mother's education and is also more negative among young people from lone parent families. And we don't see any difference between immigrant and um, Irish-born young people or parent, whose parents are Irish born. Now we find that attitudes, as the descriptive pattern showed, that attitudes to school at age nine are predictive of attitudes four years later. But so too are other dimensions of the primary school experience. So over and above how students felt about school at nine, whether they liked their teacher is also predictive of later engagement, whether they liked the, and whether they liked the subjects of reading and maths are also predictive. So these all have additional impact on, on attitudes at age nine. We find an interesting pattern in terms of prior achievement. So it's the lowest group, the lowest achieving group, group, the lowest quintile, have more negative attitudes to school than the others. But there isn't a linear relationship by prior achievement. So it really seems to be that, that, that there's a sort of polarization with that bottom group having more negative outcomes. We see that tra having transition difficulties, so having difficulty settling in, making friends, and adjusting to the new school s setting is associated with being more negative about the new school. And we also see strong effects from the, the nature of interaction with second level teachers. So it's not just where students came from in terms of their early experiences, but also, also how they were integrated into the new school community. So those who have a, kind of received a lot of positive praise and feedback, positive feedback from teachers are much more positive and engaged about school, while those who have received negative interaction are much more negative about school, which is very consistent with what you'd expect. So the interesting thing is when we look at the net effect of, of year group, we can see that people, all else being equal and controlling for all of the things I've just said, that those in second year are more than two and a half times more likely than those in first year to fall into this hating or not liking school. Um, they're, they're more likely to fall into the other category. So they're, they're really much less likely to say they, they like school very much and have much more negative attitudes to school than their peers who share the same characteristics. Some of this is accounted for by adding in the kind of role of, of teacher-student interaction. So we can see that some of it is driven by that dip I showed you earlier on of things becoming more negative with uh, teachers about school climate becoming a bit more negative for these young people as they move into second year. Sorry, what are these numbers again? What is 2.5? That's the odds ratio of second year versus first year, controlling uh, for the others. Like a and your, or it's a multi-anomial logit. <laughs> because I wanted to exploit the fact that they were uh, that there was a variety of, of categories. I mean, you, you could present it and just look at the hating, not liking either. No, no, I just yeah. maybe, maybe I dozed for a second. But no, I you're fine. Yeah. The yeah. Was, uh, yeah. So it's based on a multi-level, multinomial. So the reference category is first year. So in each case, you're comparing the people in first year who hated things in first year with what the other one was in second year. No, we're comparing, I mean, the cohort is evenly divided between first and second year. Mm -hmm. So it's people who equally hated or, or liked school at primary level, who, who equally liked, it, or liked or had the same prior achievement, had the same social background, and so on. So this is the net influence of 
being in second year, um, and then this further controls for second level experiences to see if it's related to teacher-student okay. interaction. So okay. the, the, the kids in primary school who didn't like school are two and a half times more likely to hate it in the second year. No, 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 this is the second year versus first year. So if you're in second year, mm -hmm. okay. you're more likely to hate school than if, if than the similar student in first year. All other, all the other things for control for, yeah. Okay, so what happens when we look at kind of predicted probabilities based on teacher-student interaction and liking school? So you can see that um, not liking, uh, having a high level of negative interaction, so having a, a school experience that's characterized by reprimand and little feedback means you're much more likely to fall into the kind of lower ca categories, not liking, hating, or liking only a bit. Whereas those who've experienced a good deal of positive interaction and very little negative interaction are much more likely to fall into the liking school very much group. So is it, is it true that there are, even the people who get a lot of positive feedback, half of them still, still don't, are, are, uh, yeah, these, these are predicted probabilities holding other things constant, so I wouldn't be, I, I, I would focus more on the relativities between the groups than I would on the, the actual numbers. But yes, and, and also there were, and we would have found previously, there are groups of students who get a lot of both. And in particular, we, we haven't looked at streaming here, but in particular the lower stream classes in the other research were getting a lot of, they were typically smaller, they were getting a lot of praise and, and positive feedback, but they were getting a lot of reprimand as well. So it's, it's you know, they are related, but they can be related in complex ways. And when you say high positive, are you talking about a ratio between the two, or what? Um, they would be ones that where they were a standard deviation above, above the average. So if they had above average levels of interaction, negative, positive interaction with teachers, and below average levels of negative interaction with teachers. If that makes sense. Yeah, but, but then there's an there's an initial category there, so you've got high positive, high negative. Where would they be? I didn't plot them, but yeah, you're right. But, but yeah, there, yeah. There, are, there are possibilities. Yes, yeah, okay. they are. Um, probably given the size of the coefficients, they're yeah. probably going to pitch around the average, or slightly slightly below, actually, because the negative effect is slightly stronger than the positive effect, if that makes sense. So it's worse to be given out to than it has to be priced. Um, I also looked at this using a cross-classified model to allow for the fact that people came from different primary schools, but they could end up in different second-level schools, because we have a lot of movement in the Irish system. So we have around half of the school cohort aren't going to their nearest or most accessible school. So there's a lot of movement between schools. So to try and kind of unpack that, I did additional modeling and found that attitudes to school depend on both the primary school attendant and the second individual second level school attendant. But as you'd expect, it's more driven by the second level school attendant, but you still have a quite strong relationship of, with the primary school. So the second outcome I looked at was attendance. Uh, I'm not sure how well you can see this. It just shows you descriptively um, the profile of those who were absent for 10 or more days in the previous school year. I can see everyone going like this all. OK, so this, this is social class. So you can see quite a gradient here, um, up to the semi skill manual, and the economically inactive group who couldn't be assigned to class category. So they have higher rates of, of longish attendance. There's also shows the difference by income quintile by mother's education. And so see that really with the mother's education, the big gap is lower secondary versus the others. There's a slight improvement there for tertiary, but it's it's really that kind of two categories that are important. And there's a gap between lone parents and two parent families. So as before, I did a multi-level, multinomial logit to look at the whole span of kind of low, medium, and high uh, absenteeism groups. 
So what we find is that there is, as you might expect, a significant relationship with attendance at age nine. And this shows you the odds ratios um, of the chances of being absent for seven or more days in the pr past year in second level uh, mapped by the, the number of days absence at primary level. Sorry, I probably have got myself in, in, into nuts with that. But basically, you know, this, th these are odds ratios. So like you, you're 20 times higher, more likely to be absent for seven or more days um, in second level if you were absent for 11 or more days in primary. Sorry, yeah. Um, you're, you should take advantage of the fact that you know that these things are ordered by running like an order to probe it or yeah. an order to yeah. um, Because you know that right, right? Yeah. And it has to be more yeah. than the previous case. Yeah. I, I, I doubt the results are changing. I, I did try that, but bloody wouldn't kept crashing on me on multi that and I'll win, so that's why. Yeah, but you're right. Yeah. Sorry, but, no, because you're all trying to do a multi level as well? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That, yeah, yeah, that's that's a whole another issue. You should also consider not running the multi-level, but having different controls because the multi-level makes statistical assumptions that are often not valid. Yeah, but it's just the fact that they were sampled, at, you know, as a primary school cluster, and the fact that we're measuring primary school characteristics means right, no, we're, yeah, to do that. yeah, no, I uh, yeah, I know, yeah. Uh, so if we look at the net influence of the background factors, um, controlling for other things like um, like the prior attendance and so on, we see a reduction, but but some some differentiation between the professional man manuals and the non-manual skilled versus the others. So they've reduced chances of again these are odds ratios, reduced chances of being absent for long periods of time reduced chances for those with tertiary education, increased chances for those with special educational needs, and for those who dislike school, or never like school at nine. And we see a, a small difference for those with positive interaction with teachers, but a much stronger difference for those with negative interaction. So those who, um, even controlling for their prior attendance at primary school and their engagement with school at primary level, are more likely to um, be absent. So can you control for stuff like um, whether they have positive or negative interactions with their parents as well? And, and you could, you yeah. Have I haven't in this. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, you can. I mean. And what about those kids having some sort of illness? Yeah, I haven't. I, ha I was really trying to focus on the school-related factors, and the thing with GUI, and you'll always get this is you always get that one about and there are so many things you could put in that you're absolutely right but I'm trying to look on attendance and the way it's structured as a as a measure of engagement rather than whether it's driven but you're right to, to look at it properly um, I would need to do those but I'm I'm not entirely sure what direction the relationship with parents might have yeah no I, I, I just don't know I, I don't know either yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the health controls you do yeah. probably are correlated. Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't know whether they, you could control for whether they were chronic illness, but not so much a detailed inv inventory of how often they were sick during the year. Yeah. But yeah, you could, you could at least capture some of that variation. You have some health care utilization stuff you could put in. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I talked about the relationship with attendance and it's also related to prior um, engagement at age nine, but there isn't a consistent relationship with prior achievement. So it's not the case that it's the low achieving students who are kind of have low reading and math scores at nine that are more likely to be absent uh, later on. Second level experiences do make a difference. So young people who've been experienced transition difficulties have slightly higher absenteeism levels. And I showed you the coefficient for teacher-student interaction. But we also find that attendance is much lower among those in second year than first year, all else being equal. So it kind of moves in the same direction as the attitudes to school. So the third measure I'm going to look at 
is the Pierce Harris intellectual status, which, as I mentioned, is really a kind of measure of academic self-image. It's whether students feel they're doing well with their schoolwork, whether they feel they're smart, and so on. So what's interesting, if we look on average at the change in status, in intellectual status, because we have the measure, the same measure at 9, self-reported by the, the young person at 9 and 13, and we can see on average there's a decline in self-image, academic self-image, self-confidence around schooling over the transition to second level education. But what's interesting is that decline plays out very differently by, by background characteristics. So we see that there's a much greater decline, these are just absolute levels, not controlling for anything, for girls than for boys, even though, as you've seen, you have much higher levels of engagement among the girls than the boys, and you know, ex they, have, they tend to do better in exams, but they are less self-confident about themselves as learners. We see a little bit of variation among, by social class, but really the main difference is that the the decline is greater for those in the economically inactive group than for the other social class groups. When are these uh, social classes measured? Are measured age 9 or 13? Um, these were measured age 9. They were measured at both time points, but I've used a 9 okay. because otherwise it's very hard to... Well, yeah, it'd be tricky because a lot of people won't change, but some obviously will. Some do, yeah. And it was, a, I think, I believe a hell of a lot of work to make sure that they were real changes as opposed to recording errors. Uh, but luckily I didn't have to do that. Um, so you can see that for lower educated mothers, um, they, they decline, those young people decline more in their self-image. Um, but again, it's not strictly linear. Um, Irish students, interestingly, decline more than migrants. And that seems to be part, uh, reflects the other work I did where Migrant self-concept overall, using all the, all the uh, subscales of Pierce Harris, is much more negative at nine across all the dimensions uh, the, among immigrant students than Irish, Irish peers, but that gap closes by 13. Um, yeah, that, that, that raises a general question I had about this. I mean, are we looking at gaps closing or perhaps gaps opening in, in these patterns here? We um, don't, we don't know oh, yeah, sorry, happens. yeah. Um, this gap widens. Um, yeah, so the, some of the social gaps widen, the gender gap definitely widens, and this gap closes. Um, and for, for young people's special education needs, the gap widens. Well, that's because you're taking into account the level at age nine, right? Because all these things are negative. Yeah. But the fact being that the Irish were above at nine, and you see this negative yeah. effect is why it closes, right? Yeah. But it, yeah, that it drops more for, for some than others. So when we look at changes uh, in model terms between 9 and 13, we can see that there is there's some stability in that some children, children and young people who are confident at 9 are also confident at 13, but there is a good deal of fluidity. Um, and we can see that it is influenced by primary school experiences by whether they liked school, by whether they liked their teacher, by whether they liked reading and maths. And maths achievement has a much stronger impact than reading achievement on how confident people feel as learners. And that wouldn't be exceptional in the Irish context. That other stu studies have shown that maths emerges as a bit more of a sticking point for young people. And, uh, as a source of potential difficulty around engaging with the curriculum overall. And is that different by gender, that maths issue? No. It's much more so. The attitudes, attitudes to maths differ, but it, it doesn't drive it any differently. Okay. As far as I recall, yeah. And boys were doing a bit better in the, in the drum contra maths at nine than girls were. So it's also influenced by second level experiences. So young people who've experienced difficulty settling into the new school setting um, are less confident as learners. Um, it's also influenced by how difficult they find the new school subjects and how interested they find those subjects. So we asked about English, Irish, maths, and science. 
Um, so all of these had a, an independent effect on self-image. So j again, just to show you the predicted intellectual status by teacher-student interaction. Um, Sorry, uh, just, um, yeah. You said that you, you asked Irish, English, maths, and science. Yeah. <clears throat> but they would be largely primary subjects. They are. But we, well, okay, we asked Irish, English, and maths because they all had to take them uh, at second level except the small group that had exemptions. And we asked science because we were kind of interested in the whole maths science relationship over the primary transition. But it wasn't possible to look at the other subjects in any detail because of subject choice meant the numbers dropped. And also because there's a Darwinian fight for including questions in GUI. <laughs> and nobody would let me ask about other subjects. Does that make sense? Well, yeah. but. but that, that's when the, the change would be... Uh, well, when it's a new subject, yeah. Be exposed to new subjects. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And we've, we've done other work on that. We find generally that they're quite positive about the new subjects to which they're exposed, particularly around kind of technological subjects where they, where they have access to them. Um, and in fact, sometimes having been exposed to a subject area in primary level can cause its own difficulties because how teachers handle that transition can differ. So some teachers will say, forget all you learned about maths or whatever at primary level, yeah. while others trying to try to kind of find where kids are at and then build on that. So we certainly found that um, in the other work that, you know, say people's confidence in Irish could differ depending on the primary school they went to. And so therefore the transition could be more or less easy into into a new Irish class with people with different Irish skills, for example. So it's it's not always an advantage to have had exposure to the subject before. But you're you're right; it means we can't say much about the other subjects. So this shows um, again predicted intellectual status. Um, those who had positive relations with teachers and very few reprimands. The average on both and those who have high levels of reprimand and low levels of positive feedback. So you could see quite, quite a difference in self-image by teacher-student interaction there. And as Philip said, we don't have the high high. So we can see that year group makes a difference, that all else being equal, those in second year have lower um, intellectual status scores than those in first year. And that gap isn't accounted for by teacher-student interaction, though the level of teacher-student interaction is, is quite different between first and second year. So just to conclude, what I've tried to argue is it's important to look at the transition process and how young people settle into psycho-level education, but that also stage within junior cycle matters so that we see the second years are much less positive about school and their capacity to cope with schoolwork than the first years. And this difference at least partly reflects more negative interaction with their teachers. We find too, which we haven't been able to look at before in Ireland, that engagement at primary level has longer term effects on second level engagement. But that over and above that, that the second level school climate, particularly as measured in terms of the quality of teacher-student interaction, is highly predictive of student engagement across different dimensions. So in terms of the thorny issue of junior cycle reform, it does show the importance not just of talking about changing assessment and our modes of teaching and learning, but of these being underpinned by a more positive interaction and climate between teachers and students, and it highlights the needs in terms of you know, behaviour and discipline policies to really look at moving away from systems that use more punitive sanctions towards ones that rely more on praise and positive feedback. Thank you. <laughs>